Hey everyone, welcome back to Bestie Book Reviews. I'm here with my bestie Mandy. And I'm here with my bestie Jessica. So today we're gonna do our very first monthly wrap up where we can go, we go over all of our books that we've read in the month of January and we select our top five favorites in order. So Mandy, how many books did you read for the month of January? 27. Okay. Then I hit 30. So. Well, aren't you special? <laughs> Some of us have jobs that where we can say, you just mean, is that the cold medicine talking? I'm not sure what's going on here. I can't take cold medicine because I have high blood pressure. Oh, that's right. Dang it. Okay. So. Like so, um, <laughs> just Mandy, cranky, just cranky and loopy. She's upset. Okay, that <clears throat> I'm reading two more books. No, more actually, books. as you're seeing this, I'm like, dang it, Goodreads. I don't even want to go look. It's gonna be like you're behind. Oh no, it's fine. Just tell Goodreads to bite me. Um, okay, oh, yeah, so okay, um, so we're gonna go over our top five reads of the month in order from five to one. Countdown so, style. Dun, dun, dun. Countdown style. So Mandy, number five. <laughs> number five for me was uh, Bound by Temptation by Cora Riley. That's part of her Born in Blood Mafia Chronicles. It features Liliana and Romero. And Liliana, um, her sisters, so they're part of the Mafia world. This is obviously Mafia. Liliana is the youngest out of her two sisters she has they have a younger brother but she has two older sisters they're both married into the new york outfit they're from the chicago outfit liliana has had a crush on her sister's bodyguard romero for a really long time at mm -hmm. this point it's been years and she's she's like head over heels for him and he actually likes her too um romero though is in the mafia world, just a mere soldier. He's Luca's right-hand man, but he's not important enough for her father to feel like she should marry him. And her father is, he's just awful, awful man. And so she ends up getting to spend the summer with her sisters in New York and her and Romero act on their uh, feelings for one another, I guess you could say. And they develop a relationship and Romero, like he loves her. She loves him and he wants to be with her. She wants to be with him, but her dad insists that she comes home and they figure that they'll work things out. And then Liliana is just really kind of stuck basically between a rock and a hard place because her dad decides that she's going to marry like this old man that's like her father's age and she does not want to. She wants to marry for love. And she knows her sisters will support her in this. But in doing so, this will cause a war between the two outfits. And so she's just really struggling with what does she do? Does she try to make this work with Romero? Does she end up in an arranged marriage? Like, it's just, it's a really, it's like a really hard choice for her because she loves her family, her sisters, and she does not want to cause a war that's going to lead to them getting hurt or possibly killed. Um, but she doesn't want to be married to this old gross guy. Rig <laughs> <So. laughs> little man. Yeah. So it was a fantastic read. I loved their love for each other. And I love how she is stuck in this world she doesn't want to be in, but she actually really thinks through the consequences of her acting on her feelings. Yeah. It was a good so, book. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. It was definitely a five star read. All of my top fives were my were five star reads yeah. from January. And when I wrote them out and tried to figure out like which is number one, I like scratched in my notes so many different times changing the order. So if you ask me again in a week, my order might be totally different. <laughs> well, I texted you making mine. I was like, this is really hard. Like yeah. putting them in order, this was really hard. Yeah. It was definitely hard. Yeah. So my uh, number five was um, Unbreak My Heart by Nicole Jacqueline. So this one is about Kate and Shane. So Kate's aunt and uncle are foster parents. And so when she was a young girl, I think they said she was like 12, if I remember right, um, Shane came to live with 
her aunt and uncle. And he was only there for a couple of years. He wasn't there for very long. He was a few years older. Uh, she had a little crush on him, but nothing ever happened because, you know, it didn't. And um, she was just a little quirky. She was a little different. And so he goes, she goes off to college. She comes home. Um, he is kept in contact with the family. Um, and so she comes home from college and she brings her best friend and who's her roommate. And he, uh, Shane and the roommate um, fall in love and get married. And so she just kind of wants them to be happy, even though she has feelings for Shane, but this is her best friend. And so she you know, gives them her blessing and off they go. Um, this book opens up in the very first like chapter, this is, this stuff happens. So I'm not giving anything away, but, um, even on the back of the book, they talk about it. Um, but we fast forward like 10 years later and Shane has been in the military and he's been deployed several different times. And every time he's deployed, um, Kate steps up and is technically the other parent. She's there to help her best friend with these little kids. They have three kids and the best friend is pregnant with their fourth when she is in a car accident, when Shane comes home from deployment and she's killed, the baby survives. Um, baby is, must be very close to full term because they don't even talk about it being in the NICU. Uh, and so then Kate steps up to help during, after that happens. And so the book really starts a year after the best friend had died. Uh, Kate and Shane really don't get along. Um, but these kids are like her kids. She loves these babies and she'll do anything for them. And so she's playing mom. I mean, she's playing house at this point in time. And um, some things happen between her and Shane, um, things that are irreversible. And um, that's really what the story is, is about. He gets deployed again. She stays home with the kids. But throughout the whole book, you have this little piece of he could walk away at any time. He could take the kids and say, I'm gone. And she has no she she has no control she she has she can't say no these are my kids because they're not they're his kids um and so a lot of people i saw in reviews were referring to her as a doormat and stuff and it's like no she has to keep the peace so that she can be a, with these kids because he could walk out at any moment um so yeah shane could be a real jerk um but i really i loved the story so much it was very emotional um they go through quite a bit um but oh it was so good so good. So. All right. So number four for me. And as I was looking, I'm like, I put this as number four. And oh, then I know, but then I'm like, oh, I don't know what, which one I would move back. So number four for me is Home Game by Odette Stone. Mm -hmm. This is about Ryan and Zoe. Zoe. Oh, I should preference this is number two in the Vancouver Wolves hockey series but anyway Zoe is homeless like homeless homeless like she's living on the streets she stays in a shelter when she can she has very little money and she absolutely hates her situation she was in foster care and aged out so this is how she finds herself here um, through really no fault of her own. She's working minimum wage job like at a fast food restaurant and basically the money she makes just helps her feed herself. And so she's just kind of in a really shitty situation. Ryan just got transferred to the Vancouver Wolves team. He is just feeling really lost in life because his previous team, they were like his best friends and it was a family to him. And now he's on this team where nobody really has given him much of a chance to become their teammate. And he just feels alone and lost, basically, in this new town. And he happens to be sitting at a coffee shop trying to work on some tax receipts. And his computer is giving him problems. And he thinks he just, like, deleted everything. And he's almost, like, in meltdown mode. And so he is sitting there and she leans over and tells him, like, you just need to do this. And he's like, oh, thank you. And then he ends up paying her to help him do the taxes. And then all of a sudden she freaks out because she's late for something, but doesn't tell him why. And he's like, well, I'll give you a ride. And so he takes her and to a really bad part of town and realizes that she's going into a homeless shelter, but they won't let her in because it's after their closing time. And so he watches her walk down the street. And so he catches up with her and he's like, hey, what's going on? And Zoe is fiercely independent and he offers her to help her. And she's like, no, no. And she, he's like, well, here's my card. 
you know, call me if you ever need anything, that sort of thing. And from there, um, she ends up getting beat up really badly in the streets and ends up in the hospital and she has the card on her. So they end up calling him and he shows up for her. And that's how their story starts. It's such a good story. I love that it's like a completely different storyline than what I've ever read before. And he he just genuinely wants to be a good guy. And she's basically just stuck in this position where like, well, <laughs> things really can't get much worse. So she takes him up on his offer. And this is just their love story. And it's it's different. It's unique. But it's so good. Like, so, so good. I loved it highly recommend it. And I really, I wrote myself a note. I'm like, I need to go back and read the rest of the series. Like I already want to, but I just haven't. So like, that's my next, probably one of my next reads is going to be reading more in that series. I just have the last one in that series to read, but I do like Odette Stone. She's not somebody you hear about all that often, but I love all the books I've read by her. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Okay. So my number four is, um, heart, Oh yeah, Heartless by Elsie Silver. I just finished this a few days ago. Um, so this is the story. This is the second in her, what do they call it, Mandy? Chestnut Springs or, yeah, Chestnut Springs. It's really small in this picture, so it's hard for me to see. Chestnut Springs series. Um, the first one is the one with the um, bull rider that everybody talks about. But this one I actually liked a little bit more. So this one follows Willa and Cade. So Cade is the older brother of the guy in the first book. And he is in charge of the family's ranch. He's surly. He's grumpy. He never smiles. But he does have a little boy named Luke who is, I think he's he's like five, five or six, just kind of starting that school age. Um, And Cade is looking for a nanny. Um, The little boy Luke has been spending a lot of time with grandpa. Grandpa's not the best influence. And so they want him to actually have a nanny who will um, stay with him for the summer. And after he interviews all the women in town who are just trying to get into Kate's pants, um, the heroine from the first book suggests her best friend Willow. Um, or Willa. Willa is her name. So Willa has been a bartender for years. She really has no experience with kids. She tells you how it is. Um, but if she, if you are one of her people, she will go to the ends of the earth to defend you. Um, but she brings the fun in every situation. And that is exactly what this family needs. And so they get, um, she moves in to be his nanny, even though she knows nothing about kids. Um, there's a lot of funny things that happen in this book. Um, we finally start to see Cade, you know, become not so surly. I mean, he's still surly and that's okay. Um, but she really is the relief for them, for their, for that family. Um, and she just fits in. The little boy just loves her from the get go. There's just some, a lot of fun text messages between the two of them. There's a scene in here where the, with puke that just makes my mom heart cringe because been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Um, but it is, it was, it was just really good. I am dying to read the third. Um, and I will soon, but the audio just came out this week, um, for this one. So I was able to listen to it at work this week. So, um, it was really, really good. So that was my number four. Okay. So we're on to number three. Number three. Okay. My number three book is, I have everything flagged in my book here, is Mile High by Liz Tomford. It is book number one in her Windy City series. Apparently I have a little theme here. Xander's is a hockey player. (laughs) Shocker. (laughs) Yes. He is a hockey playing man whore. Oh, shocker. And uh, the public image that he puts out is he basically prides himself on this. Like you will... Uh, we won't see him, but like people will see him leaving every night, the hockey rink with a new woman on his arm, that sort of thing. He's photographed at the bars, always different women all over him. Okay. So that's kind of his persona that he puts out there. And then he has a best friend who is the polar opposite, who's married, has kids, and is just this wholesome guy. And their agent has just constantly put this image out, like these two best friends that play hockey together, polar opposites, basically. And the agent like really upsells this to the point where Xander starts to feel like this is the like this is who people love of him. And that is 
it. Like this is the person he has to be type thing. And then on their, their private, like hockey team plane, yeah. um, Stevie gets a job. And so she's going to be the, the, one of the stewardess on there for the whole, our flight attendant through the whole season. And Stevie is not your typical, I don't know how exactly I pictured her, but she's described as she has some insecurities about her body and that sort of thing. But Xander's like immediately is drawn to her because she doesn't put up with his crap. Like she's not drooling all over him. She tells him to do stuff for himself and he's used to like women, you know, doing anything for his attention. And they have this fun little banter that goes back and forth and Stevie is massively anti-athlete. She had dated an athlete before and she um, is just, she's like, I'm not going to do it. But they end up getting together, kind of supposed to be a one night thing that turns into more. And it's just a really like sweet story of how when you meet the right one, everything starts to change. And I just love how much Xander loved her. And he understands she has some insecurities about her body image and her self-confidence, but he recognizes that she can be very self-confident in some areas. And he just really works hard to build her up and make her see herself the way he does. And it's just, it's done in such a loving way. Like I just fell in love with how much he loved her. And this is like the man horse story. I like, like he had this persona, he meets her and everything changes. And with that comes some struggles because he firmly believes that the only way he's going to get to stay on the team he's on is if he continues to put this public persona out there. And so what does that mean if he's now um, got a serious girlfriend? So it's just such a good story. I loved it. Okay. So that was number three, right? So this is yes. three. Yeah. So what's your number three? Yeah. Can't count down now. Um, my number three is The Pawn in the Puppet by Ooh. Brandy um, Elise Seeker. Uh, okay, so I'm dying to read book two at this point. I read book one early, really early in the month. Um, so this is about Skylena and Patient 13, also known as Destin. That's his actual name. Um, but this takes place in a dystopian world. And um, they have like these... The women in this world have these crazy beauty practices where they stay up at night and like have to take these crazy milk baths. They have like fainting couches all over the city because they're told to only eat if they feel that they're going to faint. So like the beauty regimen is just insane. Like there's a lot of insane things that go on in this um, in this world or in this city that, that she's in. Um, Skylena's sister has recently passed away. And before she passed away, she worked at this asylum. And she was like a, a nurse, you know, took care of the patients at this asylum. And so um, she has, she told her sister all about it. Um, obviously, oh, guys, check triggers. Really, really check those triggers. They're listed at the beginning of the book, but but check those triggers. Um, so she, so, so Skylina decides she's going to go get a job at this um, asylum to figure out like what really happened with her sister up to her death like what really happened um when she gets there like the things they do to the inmates or to the, the i shouldn't say the inmates the patients that's what they are the patients um at this hospital are it's disgusting it's horrible um and she doesn't want to take part in that she wants to change things she wants to do things differently um not torture them to get answers or whatever she wants to or to get them to to behave you never get to go home when you get put in the asylum by the way um and the, the reasons that people are put in the asylum are really stupid reasons, but that's just part of the society that they live in. Uh, so anyhow, she gets there. She meets a guy who's like on the board and he's like, I, I will let you do different things. Um, you have to prove to me that these are going to work and you're going to work with patient 13. And up until this point, she'd been told that patient 13 liked to play mind games and you, she was not allowed to see him, not allowed to go anywhere near his, the 13th room, his wing. Um, she's got this idea that through everybody else that he is, I mean, obviously that he's absolutely crazy, but he's demented and he plays these crazy mind games and like he's broken a nurse's back, um, before and, and all these crazy things. 
So um, they said, but you're going to work with patient 13. And so she goes to work with him. A few weeks later, something happens and he gets, the board decides that the only way to deal with him is to execute him because he's not going to get better. And so she is given a certain amount of time. It's been earlier in the month. I can't remember if it was six weeks, but she's given a certain amount of time to try to get, um, he has multiple personality disorder. So they want her to bring out the original personality. And so she has a certain amount of time to do that. In, and if she doesn't, then he will be executed. And so that is basically all I can tell you about this book. Cause if I give you anything else, it's, it, it's going to give away the book, but I plan to start reading the second book today. Okay. I, that is on my TBR and I'm glad you brought it up again. Cause I really need to read it. I know, but you wanted to wait till they were all out, but there's three out of the five, I think that are out right I now. I know. I do. Or maybe it's three or four out of the five. Yeah. So, but I can't wait anymore. So. That good, okay. huh? Yes. That good. I loved it. I don't know. You and I, we like the same things, but then we don't. I like some of the darker stuff. So I don't know. We'll see what you think. Okay. So um, number two. Number two for me is uh, Kalia Reads Unravel. It's book one in the Fairfax series. There's only two books in the series, but they're standalones, basically. Um, Unravel is a romantic suspense, so it's really difficult to talk about this book. Because mm -hmm, <laughs> yep. uh, pretty much anything you would say starts to give stuff away. But let's just go with the basics. So we have Naomi who is in a mental hospital. We have no idea why she's in this mental hospital. And um, this is all told from her point of view. She insists that she is not crazy, but she is concerned that she might start to go crazy if she can't get herself out of this mental hospital. So she's starting to question her sanity a little bit as well. And she has these flashbacks to her friend, Lana. She has flashbacks to somebody named Max, and she has some flashbacks to Lachlan. Although at times it appears that Lachlan is truly visiting her at the mental hospital, but she's a mental patient. So can we trust her? Because there's a time where she's in her room freaking out about this man in there. And the nurse comes in and assures her that nobody else is in this room. And so as everything's going through this story, I just don't know like when I can believe her. <laughs> I count of things and when I can't, because as the reader, you don't know why she's there, but she has intense love feelings for Max, but she also seems to have the same intense love feelings for Lachlan. And so it's one of these stories that's just so incredibly good. And as you're reading it, like you cannot put it down. Like there's no good point to stop this book and be like, okay, I'm going to go to bed. Like <laughs> it's mm -hmm. just so good. You have to keep reading it. I absolutely loved it. It has some heartbreak in it. So definitely check triggers. But if you're intrigued about reading about a girl who is in a mental hospital, who has some very strong love interests, you should read this book. It's really, really good. So good. And that's really all you can say about this book. Like, I don't know. I know you've read it, so I don't know what else yeah. I would say that and isn't going to give anything away. Both, we both read it. We both loved it. So that should be enough. Yeah. Like, we both loved it. And we both have very, while we read this, similar things, and there's some things we love, like we both love, there's, we also are on opposite sides of the spectrum for other things, too. So yeah, that should be enough. We both loved it. Just go read it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I was just hooked. Like she's in a mental hospital, but she's not crazy, according to her. Like according to her. What's then... that say that two of our top reads for the month were patients <laughs> in mental hospitals? <laughs> like I don't know. I think I read Unravel because you told me to. <laughs> you, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah, and you did, yeah. and it was good. Great. Okay, so my number two is Lessons in Sin by Pam Godwin. Oh my God, I want to read this so bad. <laughs> so good. Okay. <laughs> So this is about Tinsley, who is 18 years old, and she is um, rebelling a little bit. Her mom has kind of kept her under her thumb. Her family is a very wealthy family with a lot of ties. And we don't know if it's like mafia ties or what, but they've got ties to things. And so her mom wants to keep her a virgin because she's going to sell her off and marry her for the family business to merger like you know for a merger purpose or whatever so the mom finds her or finds out that she was giving head to a guy um 
at work or after school or something. She's going into her senior year. And mom decides that, nope, I'm going to take you to this Catholic school, um, all girls school, and lock you away for the year to keep you a virgin. Um, they're not even Catholic. So that's interesting. Uh, so Tensley gets there and she, he meet, she meets Father Mangus. Oh, Father Mangus. Father Mangus is 40. He is a, was a self-made billionaire until he went through something about 10 years earlier and decided that he was going to dedicate his life to God and he became a priest. And so he and his best friend started this school for these girls. And that is where Tinsley is at. Um, Father Mangus is hot. Period. Exclamation point. Period. Exclamation point. Like, he's just hot. Um, the girls um, at the school like to watch him work out in the morning, and they call it um, morning worship. He doesn't know that they're watching them, watching him. Um, oh, it's just so good. So there's a huge age gap, and there's that whole, like, in his previous life, he dated older women, but he's also a sadist, and he'll tell you he was a sadist, and that was part of who he was in the past. And so he's really thrown off by when he meets Tinsley, the feelings that she invokes in him and brings out in him and how he wants to immediately act on them. And he has to like really pull back. Um, but yeah, he's her teacher, headmaster teacher, and he's her priest. And the things they get up to, mm -mm. yummy, yummy, yummy. <laughs> so um, I don't know there's much more that can be said about it other than she's dying to get rid of her virginity dying but nobody will take it because her mom because of this whole merger thing with her mom and they're like there's mentions of the parents and, and the mom having a bodyguard and if mom finds out about certain things then he will be killed and, and that kind of stuff so there's that intrigue as well but um number two definitely worth the read and like i said i put it off i mean i told you this before i put it off put off reading it for a long time because i knew i was going to absolutely love it and so i wanted to wait for a time where i could really get into the book and I love everything Pam, Pam Godwin does. I really do. Okay. She's Your a good number author. One, what? She's a good author. She's a great author. Your number one read for January is... Okay. My number one read for January is Luca by Cora Riley. <laughs> I'm not surprised. So Luca is um, part of the uh, Mafia Chronicles series. It's called, I think it's called 0.5 in her list because it is Luca's point of view from Bound by Honor. So Bound by Honor is um, Aria's point of view and Luca is Luca's point of view, basically. Um, it was a solid five read for me because I just love Luca so much. He is, he is everything. I love a broody, strong alpha who does anything for his woman. And so they're in an arranged marriage because of course it's mafia. So um, Aria is a pretty dutiful daughter, honestly. She like goes along with it. She's not happy about it, but she goes along with it. And she's pretty nervous about the whole thing. And Luca, even though he's this like... <clears throat> what asshole persona to everyone else. He actually has a sweet spot for Aria and it starts off slowly, but he does, I can't give anything away, but he does a lot of really kind things for Aria, but he also does some stuff that is pretty messed up in like from the, from Aria's point of view, where like when you read Bound by Honor, you're like, what the heck is he thinking? What a jerk. But when you read Luca's book, you see that he feels like some of his actions are justified because any other mafia wife, this is what she would want to have happen. Like, just leave her alone, basically. And he doesn't realize that Arya truly wants to try and make their marriage work. So he's a little confused at some of like her reactions to some of the things he does. So I really appreciated her perspective because he was, I don't think he was ever trying to be an asshole or disrespectful to Aria, even though that's how he comes across. And at times he's doing stuff because he's actually truly trying to protect her. And so I already loved Luca when I started Bound by Honor. Um, 
and I was not quite halfway through when I decided to read Luca with Bound by Honor at the same time. And it really like completed that those two books for me. But I just I love Luca. So how could his <laughs> book not be my favorite of read yeah. of January? So go Thanks. read some Cora Riley people. Mm-hmm. She's got a new one coming out though. A new I one. know I saw a new series. I'm still trying to make my way through her one series, but yes. But did you see that she um shut down her Facebook page? I didn't. There's been a lot of hate sent to her because people wanted other books, um, even threatening her daughter, who's only a couple of years old. What? And so she shut down. That was that was the tea that happened this week. So she shut down her Facebook page and basically said, if you want information, like if you want to keep up to date with what I'm writing, then you're going to have to get it from my newsletter. So you have to go to her Web page and get her newsletter sent to you. She's still on Instagram. I don't know. It's it's so and they do it to her quite often. Um, because when she was talking about, there was another book that was going to come out um, a while back and the female main character, it was supposed to be in a wheelchair and it was written, like it was coming out. I had it pre-ordered and she pulled it from the shelf because of stuff that happened with it. It wasn't necessarily hate. It was not being sensitive enough. People didn't think she was sensitive enough um, in the, to people with, you know, who are in wheelchairs or something in the book. Um, but it had a lot to do with the mafia world where you could just be, you know, the, the mafia world's different than what we live in. Anyhow, she got a lot of hate from that. Um, she talked in her message she sent out about having a lot of anxiety over just social media in general because of all of it. So, so no more Facebook page for Cora, which is sad, but I'm yeah. still going to read her book. It's sad. It's really sad. Really sad. So. I just, I don't get that. If you're not happy with something that the author is doing, then just move don't. move on. Why do you need to post hate? Well, like, I mean, it's, if they're the author, if they want to write it, that's their prerogative. Yeah. Write your own book if you don't like it. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Okay. And another news. This isn't going to be a shocker for you either. My number one pick for January the devil devil of dublin by bb Easton. oh my gosh i'm gonna fall off my chair i'm so shocked. so surprised i know shocker okay so this story follows darby and kellen and so darby um her grandpa lives in ireland she lives in the united states with her mom and uh her mom decides to take her to ireland to see her grandpa when she's eight years old and so when she gets there she's outside hanging out with the sheep um, on the farm and grandpa's like, Hey, have I ever told you about the fairies that live in the woods? And so grandpa goes into the story about all the fairies and gets into this Irish folklore and sends her off to play in the woods. And so when she goes out into the woods, she comes across this old cottage that is nothing but ruins like, um, rock stone ruins at this point in time. And she finds a little boy there who is dirty um, whose hair is hanging in his face. He doesn't talk. He's got a split lip. So we can tell that he's being abused. Um, she has little um, cookies. And so she offers him one and he eats it like a rabid dog because the kid is just starving. And um, she thinks that he's a fairy. And so this is Kellen. And so Kellen is 10 and Darby is eight at this point in time. And so she plays with him and she can swear up and down that he is, she swears up and down that he is a fairy. Um, she decides to play, um, Hogwarts or something with him and uh, when she's getting ready to leave she notices the split on his lip which he does not talk he's mute um, but she notices the split on his lip and she um, takes what they were pretending to be their wands and she kisses the end of his wand and puts it to his lip to heal it like her mom would have kissed her and he gets emotional about that we can tell by the way it's described that he gets emotional about that um, so then every year she travels back to Ireland to visit her grandpa and every year, Kellen is waiting for her in these same ruins. And as he gets older, he starts to, like, build, make a home out of it. Because that's where he's he spends all of his time. He was dropped off when he was a toddler uh, by his mom to the local priest. And the local priest is very cruel to him and says that he's the spawn of Satan and whatever. Um, but, and the whole town believes it, that his dad was, was the devil. And so this poor kid is just put, he's just, he's tortured. And so um, she comes back every year. There's actually one year where she can't come back because her mom doesn't have the extra money. And um, he gets very upset with her. And it's just really sad to see. This book, like, sucked me in from the get-go. 
just immediately. I was like four chapters in. I'm like, I have to own this book. Have to. So I had to go buy the book. Um, anyhow, but, um, and then they're separated for um, a good chunk of years. And the book really picks up when Darby comes back. She's like 20 and she's engaged to another man and she comes back for her grandfather's funeral. And um, at this time she does, she believes Kellen is dead. She hasn't been able to find him. She um, hasn't heard from him in years. And so she doesn't, she thinks he's dead and come to find out he's actually joined the Irish mafia during this time. And so he's working for them. So um, that's where the story really picks up. What I really enjoyed about the story is not the fact that he was in the mafia. It's the fact that he wanted to get out of the mafia and get her safe for her. Oftentimes when we read mafia books, it's more like, oh, I'm in the mafia and you just have to accept that and come on along. But no, he was like, how am I going to protect her? How am I going to get out of this to make a better life for us? And that's what I really enjoyed about this. Um, plus the Irish folklore. And it's just, oh, it was, it's a favorite read. Like it's an all time favorite read for me. So this is my number one. I'm just going to sit here and pet my book. Mandy. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. You're petting your book. That's it's weird. So, it's so pretty. It's so pretty. <laughs> the the book. This is a special edition hardback that's signed by BB. But the actual book itself um, has the the model on the cover. Oh my goodness. Just saying. All right. All right. Okay, well, that's our January wrap up. Yeah, so our those are our five reads. Top five each, so top ten for January. Yes. Yeah. So join us next time. I mean, next time we'll do this one will be at the end of February. So we'll see what we have yes. in February. But um, until then, what was one of your favorite reads for the month of January? And make sure to check back on Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays for new videos from us. All right. Until then, go read. Thank you.